emphasis throughout our worship has been on uh, has been on the church, church the thing that Christ Jesus died for. So we're still talking about Jesus today. We're coming at it from a slightly different uh, angle. And I've got to confess uh, to y'all that this is a sermon that I have wanted to preach to y'all since last January. Uh, I preached a sermon that was called uh, Five Things a Pastor Is Not and Five Things a Pastor Is. Uh, some of you remember that. Uh, it was a really good nap day for others of us. But uh, today is something in a similar vein where we're talking about what the church is and what the church is not. And, and we heard a lot of it. There's a lot in this passage, and there's a lot more that could be said uh, about what the church is and what the church isn't. And so today we're looking at what the church is and what the church isn't. I'm gonna... So to get us started, I'm going to give you some observations. Uh, first off, in Ephesians 4, it's there on page 828. If you want to follow along, we're going to be referencing it throughout uh, the sermon today. Uh, Paul says uh, that he's a prisoner for the Lord. Paul points out his prisonership for the Lord. He then says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then he gives us a list. If any of us can hit this list, we'd be doing pretty well. Don't you think? Just listen again to the list. He says in verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. I mean, this this probably sounds more like a New Year's resolution list that we would write for our spouse. <coughs> Doesn't it? I mean, it sounds pretty great. I mean, if my spouse could just you know, be a little more patient, be a little more humble, be a little more loving, be a little bit more bearing with me in love, you know, that'd be great. What about my manager at work? Oh, if they could be all of these things, that'd be great too. What about that annoying coworker? Yeah, if they, if they could get on this list, that'd be nice, too. What about that one relative? You know the one I'm talking about? The one that you put up with? What if they could hit this list? That'd be great. But Paul writes us this list, and he says this is what he's urging the church to. This is what he's urging us to. To be completely humble and gentle, to be patient, to bear with one another in love, to make every effort, in other words, another way to frame that, to say that, to bend over backwards, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. A couple more observations. You notice in verse 4 he starts this list. It's a pretty interesting list. Do you notice how many times in this list um, the word one comes up? It comes up all over the place. He starts the list in verse 4. He says, you can count it along with me if you want. If you've got busy or anxious fingers like I do sometimes, you can count along with me. All right, so there is one body and one spirit. This is the part where you guys say one. It's okay, you'll get it. <laughs> Just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one, one faith, faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Seven times. Seven times. And in this really short span, he just keeps hitting on the oneness of the church. You can't escape it. As he calls to the church and gives instructions to the Ephesian church, Paul points out the oneness of who God is, the oneness of our faith, the oneness of who we believe in, and therefore the oneness of who we ought to be. There's a lot of this oneness in here. Now there's an Old Testament passage, Deuteronomy 6, you don't need to flip over there, but you can look there later on this afternoon if you'd like. In Deuteronomy 6, we hear, it's a very famous passage, especially even today in Jewish circles, it's still recited, it's called the Shema, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Paul is kind of riffing on that. He's kind of jazzing along with that. He's, he's bringing that to mind. He's saying, our God who is one, and then look at all these other things that we share together that's common. Look at all of these things. To one Lord, to one faith, to one baptism, to one body, that body being the church, to one spirit, that being the holy church. One hope. The hope of what? The hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. 
And we're called to this one faith and this one Lord, even as God is, is one. That passage in Deuteronomy is sometimes a stumbling block for Orthodox Jews today. It's one of the reasons why many of them deny Christ Jesus as Lord and as God. They look at that passage and they say, well, how can, how can God be two? How can there be God the Father and God the Son? There's only one God. And we would say, yes, there is only one God. And he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We see this in this very passage. Paul brings up the nature of Christ's divinity in this very passage. Even as he's referencing, even as he's calling up this one language, referencing back to Deuteronomy 6. He says in verse 7, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the earthly lower regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the universe. This is Paul referencing and bringing up and teaching Christ's divinity. I said earlier today, where is Christ physically now? He's ascended. He is in heaven. He is with us and in us through his Holy Spirit. But he is ascended. And Paul here brings up the ascension. He's talking about the one who ascended. So who was it who ascended? It's the Sunday school answer. Jesus. All right, so the one who ascended, well, he also descended. In Advent, in the Incarnation, we celebrate when God became man. But the birth of Jesus wasn't the start of life for a new branch or a new part of God. The second person of God in the Trinity always was. He was always there. But we celebrate his humanity, his birth as a human in the Advent, in the Incarnation, at Christmas time. In other words, there was never a point in time in which the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, didn't exist. He always existed. In the language of the Gospels, as the Gospel of John would put it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is Paul's way of bringing up the divinity of Christ. He talks about the ascension and the one who descended, meaning that Christ came from above. That in order for Christ to take on flesh, he had to come from somewhere. That the Advent wasn't his starting point or his creation. He was the one through whom all of creation was made. Speaking about Christ, then Paul turns his focus and his attention in verse 11 to what Christ has done for the church. What has Christ done for the church? Well, he says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. So Christ Jesus gave to his church these various gifts or roles or callings. Why? Verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service. Why do those works of service matter? Well, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay, so some observations aside, let's, let's talk about what the church is and what the church isn't. The church is not a community center. The church is a community with Christ at its center. All that the church aims to be, all of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of our goals, all of what we aspire to, it's all found in Christ. When we share about who Jesus is with people who don't know him, it's because our goal is that they would know and come to a saving knowledge and faith of the redemption of Christ, the saving work of Christ. Beyond the redemption of Christ, what about the grace of Christ? The grace of Christ, of Christ which is poured out on people like you and me, whom even though we have known the redemption of Christ, we still need His grace. His grace which is poured out even in forgiveness of, of people who still sin against Him. This is one of the reasons why we confess our sin each and every week. 
We confess our sin because we know God's expectations and we, we utterly fail them. We do not live up to them and so we depend on Christ's grace daily and weekly. I'll put this to you another way. Have you ever had anybody over to your house who's never been before? When they come over for the first time, they don't know the way how you do things in your house. They don't know if you're a shoes on or a shoes off kind of house. So they walk in and they have their shoes on. You go, oh, we're a shoes off kind of. Oh, I'm so sorry. Kind of take off your shoes. They walk into the living room. Maybe they sit down in your lazy boy in your favorite chair. But, you know, they didn't know. They didn't know. And so, you know, we might have something nice to say. Oh, bless them. They didn't know. Oh, that, that's my chair. That's kind of where I usually sit. You can sit over here, right? They're ignorant at first. They don't know the way we do things around here. Then there's another kind of person who knows, who knows what the expectations of the house are, who knows that we're a shoes off kind of people, and they decide, you know what, I got some muddy boots, I'm going to walk all through the nicely cleaned carpet. They know the expectations, they know where the favorite chairs are, and so they go and they find the favorite chair and they sit down in it, and they cross their arms as if to say, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> This is why we're dependent on God's grace. While we were still sinners, of course we did all of these offensive things to God. We did not know. But now that we know, now that we have come to a saving knowledge of Christ and we know the expectations for the house, boy, that's a game changer. Now when we walk through the house, your guest, your proverbial guest, your hypothetical guest, would you not treat them differently if they walk through your house with muddy shoes and they know better? We have phrases, don't we, that we teach our little children. You know better, or you should know better. There's a difference there. And so, too, this is also another aspect where the church at its center is Christ, the grace of Christ on a daily basis. What about the example of Christ? The example of Christ. What Christ Jesus chose instead of all the riches of this world. Uh, many of us know that passage of the temptation of Jesus. <clears throat> it's recorded in many of the Gospels. When Jesus was taken out into the wilderness, and he was tempted by the evil one. And when we read the passage, we can easily say, oh, well, it's the evil one. Don't fall for his trap. I mean, it says it right there. He's the bad guy. It says the evil one. Right? So it makes it really easy. But Christ Jesus, in the moment, he was tempted and was offered all of these wonderful worldly pleasures. And instead of accepting them, what did he choose? He chose the cross. Now I want you to think about this in some very practical, pragmatic terms. What would you do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> yeah. This is not an invitation to get me a Klondike bar, by the way. I know I brought up candy in the past, and then people have given it. That's not what this is. I'm not asking for a Klondike bar. But think of it for a moment. What will people do for a Klondike bar? Have you ever seen any of those videos? I saw one of them where there's one person on one side of a very busy, crowded New York intersection, and then they're asking on the other side, what would you do for a Klondike bar? Would you cross <coughs> this very busy street at this high traffic time of day for a Klondike bar? Oh yeah, I'd do that. What would you change in your behavior just for a Klondike bar? What sort of silly thing would you be willing to do just for a momentary dessert? A lot of us would go, I'd do a whole lot for a Klondike bar right about now. But what did Christ do? He had all of the fleshly kingdoms in front of him. And he turned that away. He said, I'll take the cross instead. I'm going to turn it from a Klondike bar just into another paycheck. How many of us would change what we're willing to do or say? Just a little tweak. Just a little compromise. Nothing major. How many of us would be willing to make a little tweak, a little change? Just for one extra paycheck. Not even big bucks, just one extra paycheck. Just a little Christmas bonus. And yet, what did Christ Jesus do in his temptation in the wilderness? He scorned all of the fleshly desires of this world. And he said, no, I'll take the cross. Now, we, we have a high view of the cross because we have a high view of Christ. And so we think, well, the cross isn't that bad. Well, the cross is awful. Christ turned away all of those fleshly pleasures Way better than a Klondike bar. Way better than a paycheck. He turned it all away. 
And he chose the cross, a cross where he had no rights, stripped naked, no followers, no bank account, no dignity. He said, I'll take that. What? Are you kidding me? I'm taking the Klondike bar. But he said no to all of the fleshly pleasures of the world. And he said, I will take the cross. Why did he do that? Because of his love for the church. Does that kind of reorient us for a little bit? Does that kind of change our compass a little bit? No. Christ gave all that up for the church. Because he loved the church so much, he said, I'll take the cross. I'll take all the shame that comes with it. I will, bear the penalty, I will bear the penalty of all of the sin. I'll do that. Because I love the church. And so sure enough, the church is not a community center. The church is a community with Christ at its center. The church isn't a charity club. We're not a philanthropist group. But we do acts of charity. Not because that's what we're about, but because that's what Christ Jesus did. And he is growing in us. There's always more who are in need. There are a lot of philanthropist groups that claim to have a long-term outlook on things. They say, well, if you follow through with our 12-step program, if you get a job, if you complete your GED, if you do all of these things and you make all of the right phone calls and you say all of the right things, then maybe over the next year we can get you here, and over the next two years we can get you there, and over the next three years you can start saving money, and maybe over the course of the next five to ten years you can have a down payment saved up and own your own house. And they call themselves long-term philanthropist groups. They just have a 10-year plan. The church, the church of Jesus Christ, speaks about an eternal plan. A never-ending, forever-lasting plan. That's what I call long-range thinking. That's some long-term planning. That's thinking ahead by a long shot. This is one of the reasons why the work of the church is essential. Not because of the philanthropy that we do or the charity that we do, but because of eternity and its perspective. Because eternity lasts forever. We've all heard it. I'm not making a, a political statement here this morning. I'm simply referencing things that we've heard. We've all heard over the last couple of years debates over whether or not this business or that business or this establishment or that establishment or this church or that church are essential. Are these things essential? Do they need to stay open? Should they close? Are these things essential? Will you tell me if a philanthropy group that's got a 10-year plan needs to stay open? Do you think the body of Christ, which has eternity in view, needs to stay open? The church isn't a moral best behavior education facility. The church is made up of people who are continually pursuing Christ in their lives and then repenting back to Christ. If the church was a moral best behavior education facility, then we do a really bad job of it. I'm just saying, we do a really bad job. The average television show in the 1990s and the early 2000s was somewhere between 22 minutes and about 42 minutes. That kind of sounds like a long sermon or a short sermon. Okay. Kind of sounds like that. Somewhere in that reference. I mean, we will oftentimes binge watch, won't we, in our society, many different episodes of many different shows over the course of a weekend. We could get through a whole series over a weekend. But if you spend every single Sunday coming to church, you'll have 52, 22-minute to 30-minute periods of moral best behavior education. The church is not your moral education facility. That is not what we are. If it is, we fail the task. Miserably. The church is the very body of Christ wherein people who have been fallen and broken and are on their way to hell have come to know the Savior who loves them and are growing in their faith and in their repentance of him. The church is not 
a perfect place. There's, there's not a perfect church on this side of the grave. Our church is not one perfect sermon away from becoming the perfect church. Because we are a group of people who are constantly in need of repentance and growing in the grace of Christ Jesus. So, do we change our behavior? Oh yeah, we do. But we change our behavior because Christ has changed us. You see, what you do is mostly about who you are. And so for those who have been saved in Christ Jesus, we are no longer slaves to sin. And so what we do shouldn't, shouldn't look like we're slaves to sin. We've been changed from the inside out if we have faith in Christ Jesus. The church isn't a no-judgment-allowed club. The church must exercise judgment over its parts in order to assure health and proper use. I saw a, a meme or a picture, I'm not sure if it was photoshopped, so I don't want to say that this is accurate or this is true of some church out there. It might simply be a joke. But there was a picture of a church with a sign outside that said, No judgment allowed. No judgment allowed on the outdoors of the, of the church. If the church is a no judgment allowed church, I got bad news for it. Christ Jesus, when he comes a second time, he comes not as a baby, he comes what? As a ruling, judging king. So you realize the irony of having a statement outside a church that says no judgment allowed. Christ in his second coming isn't welcome at that church. Judgment gets exercised all the time in the church. Now, it's not the kind of judgment that you and I are thinking of when we think, oh, I hope that person's not judging me. Judgment means making decisions. Could you imagine if we put that sign? Um, what if I asked Dee, hey Dee, on Monday, can we put out on the front sign, we make no decisions in our church, no decisions allowed here in our church. Imagine the chaos that that would bring in our church. Well, what should we do about the budget? Well, we're not allowed to make decisions. Well, what time should our service? Well, we're not allowed to make decisions. No judgment. Well, I'd like to invite so-and-so. Well, are you judging them? Are you making a decision that you should invite so-and-so? We're at no judgment church. We're at no decision church. There's all sorts of decisions and judgments to be made. And the New Testament oftentimes speaks of the church glowingly and prescriptively as the church is to make judgments. We're supposed to make judgments about different things. I'll put this to you another way. Imagine a doctor. Imagine a doctor. You go to a doctor because you got a, a busted knee. So you go to the doctor, you get an x-ray. doctor puts up the x-ray chart and says, oh yeah, it's busted. Busted real good. So, okay, well doc, what should I do? And the doctor says, I don't want to judge. <laughs> doc, I want to walk again. Doc, my knee hurts. Doc, I want to get back after it. Doc, I need to get healed. I don't want to be this way anymore. I don't want to judge. I'm just going to leave you in your state. As a church, we are called to exercise judge, judgment, good judgment, godly judgment, as the body of Christ. Now, when judgment happens improperly, we would call that a bad thing. But when judgment is exercised rightly, it gets hurting, broken, repenting people back on the track towards health. Lastly, the church isn't of this world. The church isn't of this world. The church has got other stuff on its agenda other than this world does. Our agenda looks different. Our priorities look different because we've got a great God whom we serve. We get our marching orders directly from Him. Not because we've made them up. Not because our traditions say so. Not because we've done it this way for so long. We get our marching orders from Christ because it is Christ's church. When you die for it, you can come and let us know what you'd like done with it. He did die for it, and he lives for it even today. And so he has jurisdiction, all the jurisdiction, over his church. Our passage today wraps up by giving us an explanation, talking about babies and grown-ups. It says in verse 12 and 13, 
so the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. The goal of the church, the goal of our church as we participate in Christ Jesus' goal, the goal of our church and all of our programming and all of what we do and all of what we preach and all of what we say, the goal is to take babies from immaturity and to grow them to maturity. That's not from me. That's the Apostle Paul. That's the way how he puts it. Babies can't do a whole lot for themselves, can they? My sister-in-law recently had a baby, and it was fun uh, yesterday uh, uh, on Christmas Day to see the little baby. And it was also fun to notice different patterns of behavior around the little baby. I'm always terrified to hold the little baby. Does anybody share this terror with me, this fear? I'm always afraid to hold the little baby. I just, I've never dropped a baby, but I'm just worried. Uh, baptisms are really awkward. But but come bring your baby for to be baptized. Ooh, that, that's weird. That's a weird invitation. My pastor doesn't want to hold my baby and he's nervous he's going to drop it. Anyway, babies change behavior. And babies change behavior over time. This little newborn baby, when she was in the arms of my wife, she looked so wonderful, holding this little precious baby. But one of the most interesting things to notice in all this baby behavior was my toddler, Ezekiel. And to notice how his behavior changed around the baby. You see, when Amy wasn't holding the baby, Ezekiel was running up and down the steps, playing with presents, having a great time. As soon as my wife Amy was holding the baby, it's like Ezekiel had a sixth sense. Hey, somebody's holding my mommy. <laughs> who's, who's that in my mommy's arms? That's my mom. Now, if we left Ezekiel to his own devices, who knows what he might do? He is being a toddler. In the church, we are called to grow up from infancy into maturity. Brothers and sisters, our Bible studies that we do and our prayer meetings together are not pointless. They're not pointless. They're not there so that way you can win a Bible trivia contest. Have we even had one of those this year? Not yet. That's not why we do what we do. All that we do in this church is to hopefully, hopefully, we fail oftentimes, but to hopefully follow in Christ's footsteps as he's called us, to follow his marching orders, to grow from infants to maturity, to grow up in the faith, and to no longer do the things that babies do. To grow up. A lot of churches just emphasize, we want new believers to come and get to know the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith. I reference what I referenced on Christmas Eve. 24 times throughout the New Testament, Jesus is talked about as Savior. But over a hundred times in the New Testament, he is called Lord. He is called Lord. Yes, he is our Savior. And babies, little ones in faith, need to come to a saving knowledge of who he is. But that's just the start, brothers and sisters. We've got so much growing to do. Growing in what? Reference back to that list. Growing in patience. Growing in humility. Growing in gentleness. Bearing with one, or in, one another in love. Not our spouse. Not that annoying person at work. Not even that relative. Us. We've got growing to do in the upcoming year. Why? Why does Christ want us to grow? Well, so that we will in all things, as he says in verse 15, grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Our object as Christians is not to live our best life now. That's not our object. Our object is to become more and more like Christ. If Christ was interested in in his best life now, wouldn't he have gone for the Klondike bar? For the extra time? He wasn't interested in that. He scorned the things of this world and the flesh, and he said, I'll take the cross. 
Why? Because he loved his church. He loved you. He loved me. He loved us. What a great Christ we serve, who gives us marching orders, who calls us to grow, who calls us as a body to be joined and held together, to build one another up in love as each part does its work. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, we do come to you asking that you would set before us Christ Jesus and his example and his word. Would you allow us to follow his example daily and to grow more and more, to become like him. God, we do thank you for the ways that Christ Jesus has provided for us, has worked in us, and whose grace is at work even now in us to grow us such that we will no longer be infants, but that we might grow into maturity in Christ. Through all the obstacles and doubts and moments of darkness and pain, we do thank you that it is Christ Jesus who shines all the more glorious through all these things. Would you continue to build us up as a church, as Christ's church, not as the best version of our church, but as the best version of him who is the head of our body, we pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.